Wall Street Journal columnist James Toronto pissed off pretty much everybody with an article he wrote about rape. Now, that's a red flag right off the bat. <laughs> like, if you're writing about rape, is there really that much to say? It's bad, it should be discouraged, it should be thoroughly investigated any time it happens, and we should uh, strictly punish it. That's it. <laughs> There's my article on rape. I'm done. <laughs> Let's move on to the next topic. But, no, nope, this guy apparently has more to say on the issue, because it's more nuanced than that, of course. Uh, so his article is titled, Drunkenness and Double Standards. Oh boy, you see where this is going, don't you? And he suggests that female college students are as guilty as their aggressors if they are sexually assaulted while intoxicated. He says, quote, If two drunk drivers are in a collision, one doesn't determine fault on the basis of demographic details, such as each driver's sex. But when two drunken college students collide, the male one is almost always presumed to be at fault. His diminished capacity owing to alcohol is not a mitigating factor, but her diminished capacity is an aggravating factor for him. He continues, As the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education notes, at some campuses the accusers having had one drink is sufficient to establish the defendant's guilt. In theory, that means, as, as they note, that, quote, if both parties are intoxicated during sex, they are both technically guilty of sexually assaulting each other. In practice, it means that women, but not men, are absolved of responsibility by virtue of having consumed alcohol. Now, I want to break this down in a couple different ways, but first of all, let me get to an elephant in the room that's really annoying to me that I think people should talk about more, but they never talk about. All those rules that are like, if you have one drink and you have sex, that's the same as rape. That's ridiculous. We all know that's ridiculous. If, if you have one drink and your partner has one drink and you consensually have sex, you had one drink and you consensually had sex. If you have two drinks and your partner has two drinks and you consensually have sex, you had consensual sex. If you have three drinks and, and your partner has three drinks and you have consensual sex, you had consensual sex. Do we need to go through this more? Now, is there a line where somebody's like really intoxicated and almost incapacitated where you say, look, nobody, even if they think they're consenting, they're not consenting. Absolutely, that line exists. But to pretend the line is one drink is just stupid. Everybody, everybody knows that. Anybody with a brain would admit that. So on that point right there, you know, uh, let's get that out of the way right now, because anybody who's that rigid where they say one drink is equivalent to rape, even if it's consensual, that's insanity. In that case, like, 60% of the sex ever had on the planet and 60% of the babies that have been given birth to it has been done through rape, and that's not rape, okay? So, that's point number one. But now to his ridiculousness. So, he's, make, he's doing a false equivalence. You notice what he's doing there? He's saying, well, look, man, here's the situation. If you have a woman who's drunk and a man who's drunk, and then a man has sex with the girl and she doesn't want it, well, then why don't we blame both? Because he had sex with the girl and she didn't want it! <laughs> I mean, how, how do you not realize the distinction there? He's like, well, if there's a car crash and there's, you know, one uh, girl and one guy and they're both drunk, well, we assign blame equally. We don't just say it's one person's fault. Yes, but in your car analogy, here's what it would be like. A girl has one drink and she's sitting in a parking spot. A guy has one drink and he rams into her while she's in her parking spot at 80 miles an hour. Okay, this isn't... A, I don't know... The argument he's making isn't even an argument. It's just like he's having mental and verbal diarrhea about the idea of rape. That he's like, well, why can't if we're just frat boys or whatever, get some girls loaded and take advantage of them? That's what it seems like the undertone of his article is. That, oh yeah, these poor men, these these poor guys are being falsely accused of rape, you know, in 99% of cases, and it's just the women taking advantage of the system. Really? Is that what you think's going on here? Look, it, it, here's, it, here's the reality. Are there some cases where there are false accusations of rape? Of course that exists, and that's happened. There's no doubt. But should every accusation of rape be treated incredibly serious, be thoroughly investigated, and if needed, then it goes to trial and then you punish accordingly. Yes! But the tone of his article is like, we don't even want that. We don't even want that. If there is a situation where a guy and a girl are drunk and, and uh, you know, they have sex and the guy was the aggressor and she was an unwilling participant, his response to that is, no, why can't we uh, it, assume that the charges being... Uh, levied by the female are false. Why can't we assume that they're just false and we shouldn't even investigate it and just call it what it is that, 
hey, it's a floozy, and hey, she was asking for it because she had a drink. That's what's really going on in this guy's mind. And uh, also, if you had any, if you have any reservations as to whether or not that's really what he's getting at, look at this uh, list here, this compilation that Media Matters put together of other sexist things that he said. There is a political panic about sexual assault in the military, which is a genuine problem. But people are taking it out by, you know, trying to convict men whether or not they're guilty. Well, this goes back to the uh, effort to combat the political campaign against sexual assault in the military. And this seems to be turning into an effort to criminalize male sexuality, much as we see with uh, sex sexual uh, conduct codes on campus. When did this war on men begin. Can you pinpoint a, a starting point? Well, it, it all goes back to the beginning of contemporary feminism uh, in the early 60s. Contemporary feminism is a totalitarian mindset. Kind of the nastiness of, uh, of contemporary feminism, I think, is an indication of its intellectual weakness. Women wanted to be equal to men. They wanted to be able to do all the sorts of professional things, including the military, that men could do. Was there anything wrong and, with that, though, James? I mean, that sounds that sounds well. Like that's good that's goals too to long me. to go into now. The question of what's wrong <laughs> okay. with that. You know, are you really equal when you have to have your ovaries punctured? <laughs> uh, you know, it's the basic social purpose of marriage is to control men, to domesticate men, to tie them to. Uh, women and children. So it's, men are giving up their freedom for the benefit of women and children. I categorically reject the class, by the, the label misogynist. Uh, I'm actually quite fond of women. You can call me Tyrannosaurus sex. Technological uh, innovations that enable the female body to behave more like the male body. So women can have sex without the fear of pregnancy, just like men can. And now, uh, through the use of this uh, method, uh, women can uh, have children well into middle age and perhaps beyond, just like uh, just like men can. Men, men can conceive children, uh, but it doesn't really make them equal. And when you think about it, is it really? This is the paradox of reproductive choice feminism. I wrote about. Uh, if you treat uh, the uh, a woman's capacity to become pregnant and the natural limits of a woman's fertility as if they are diseases in need of medical treatment. Is that really valuing women? Is that really liberating for women? Or is it not another form of misogyny? Well, I mean, Mary, you must have wondered to yourself at some point, how come Toronto isn't married? 